This morning we're uh, beginning a new sermon series just for Advent, and uh, there's a minor typo on the cover of your bulletin. Uh, the reference for the scripture passage on the cover of the bulletin says Matthew chapter 7. That's last week's reference, uh, but the text is correct. Uh, we are in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. And uh, if you have a pew Bible that you want to open up to, I encourage you to do that. We're going to take a brief look at the beginning of the sermon at the tail end of chapter 8. Uh, so it might be helpful for you to have the scripture open to see that. If you're at home, I hope you have a Bible handy to be able to follow along. But the text we're reading uh, can be found on the cover of your bulletin and on the screen behind me. And I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot and the trampling warrior and of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is given, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth, and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, Thanks be to God indeed. Well, this, this week, this morning, we uh, begin a new month. We begin a new season in the life of the church. We actually begin a new year. Uh, Advent is the first season in the, Christ, in the church calendar. Uh, and we begin a new series as we prepare to celebrate uh, the birth of Christ at the end of the month. Over the next four weeks, we're going to take a look at four dimensions on the arrival of the Christ this, as I mentioned at the top of the service and just a moment ago, this season in the life of the Christian church is known as Advent, which comes from the word Adventus, which means arrival. The idea here is that sometimes there are people and events that are beyond our ability, our ability to comprehend in just one look. It took four Gospels four different perspectives to attempt to give us a full understanding of who Jesus Christ is and why he came. But even one of those gospel writers confessed that even those four books aren't enough. He said there aren't actually enough books in all of the libraries, in all of the world, to contain everything that Jesus said and did. Combine the magnitude of that person with the intensity and significance of his coming, and we're not able to grasp the fullness of Advent in just one look. Next week, we will look at why it is so significant that Jesus Christ left all of the glory, the splendor, the perfection of heaven and came into the mess of our world and our lives in order to redeem and sanctify us. Following that, we will look at the next coming of Christ when he returns. He came once as a lonely child born in a stable, and he said he would return soon. Well, what? When? When is soon? It's been 2,000 years, which I don't know about you, is not how I define soon. And how does this having not come yet impact our attitudes and our actions right now? And then finally, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, we will view the arrival of the Christ from the perspective of heaven. 
the incarnation moved through heaven and earth. It's, it's a moment when eternity and temporality came crashing together and caused a cosmic upheaval. Then on Christmas Eve, we'll wrap it all together and see how the incarnation of Jesus Christ interrupts our lives today just as much as it did the lives of Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, and so many others 2,000 years ago. This week, we look at the arrival of the Christ from the perspective of those who lived before he came. Israel placed all of her hope for their future on the coming of the Christ, the Messiah. How does the way he came prepare, uh, compare to the way they expected him to come? What impact does that have on us and our hopes and expectations this holiday season? And it all starts 700 years before Jesus Christ was born. The situation back then left much to be desired. Their neighbors to the north had been wiped out, gone, nothing left. It was as if the entire world was against them and waiting for one little mess, misstep, and it was. They had barely survived the last attack, the one that had raped the land and countryside around them. Food was scarce, and it was cold. All the more cold because of the fear and darkness that everyone felt inside. The good news? None of it had happened yet. The bad news, this description, but scratches the surface of what they would encounter. They will pass through the land, greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Thus spoke the prophet Isaiah to the people of Jerusalem and Judah, following the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel at the hands of the mighty Assyrian Empire. Those words that you see on the screen that I just read are the very last words of chapter 8. And they immediately precede our scripture reading this morning. Prior to this, just a couple of chapters before, Isaiah begged Ahaz, the king of Judah, to trust in the Lord in order to save himself and his kingdom from this fate that was sure to happen. But Ahaz chose instead to trust himself and to look for help from other kingdoms, such as Egypt. The result of that distrust, because Ahaz wouldn't trust the Lord, were these prophecies of certain doom for the kingdom of Judah. But prophecies aren't entirely about doom and gloom. Most of the time we think they are. Sprinkled throughout Isaiah, in almost all of the last 20 chapters of the book, are images of their salvation, an end to their suffering, a return to the glory that they knew under the reigns of King David and King Solomon just a few generations prior. The image Isaiah casts in these passages of hope are simply stunning. The contrast being drawn is shown immediately. But there will be no gloom for her, her who was in anguish. The rest of the opening verses paint an incredible scene. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. It is this image, given not only by Isaiah, but by the other prophets in the Old Testament as well, that has enabled the Hebrew people to persevere and have hope through thousands of of years of struggle and oppression. We can embrace the fullness of Israel's hope ourselves by recognizing the three ways our hope is the same as theirs. The opening word of verse 4 indicates a cause and effect situation. Judah will be able to enjoy this beautiful vision 
because God has done something magnificent. For the yoke of his burden, the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as, in the, as on the day of Midian. Now, if you go back into your Old Testament, particularly into the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 26, you find there that the ultimate punishment for not repenting and obeying the Lord would be exile from the promised land and to be ruled by their enemies. In, in uh, Leviticus 26, you kind of have this progression where if you start to stray, then this, these are the corrective steps God will do to bring you back to faithfulness. But if ultimately you don't repent... God's going to kick you out of the land that he promised to give you. It was it, No greater pain could have been imagined by the Hebrew people, by the Israelites, than the possibility of God kicking them out of the promised land. The imagery of this verse reminds the reader of a prior time of such unbelievable oppression. It goes all the way back to the book of Judges. And it was when Midian oppressed the 12, time, the 12 tribes during that time. At that time, God also provided a miraculous means of relieving the oppression under which they suffered. You probably have heard the name before. It was Gideon. Probably heard of uh, Gideon's Bible. You go to a hotel, you often find Gideon's Bible. That's a reference to this guy, Gideon, who God raised up to deliver the Israelites from the oppression of the, of the Midianites. The images continue to impress upon us the, the suddenness of this miraculous restoration. The exhaustive weight of their oppressors would be shattered. After living as, as an oppressed people for such a long time, they would finally experience the freedom God intended for them all along. The focus here was on the most real oppression that the people felt geopolitical oppression, the oppression of someone else coming in and taking away your freedom, telling you what you can and can't do. Israel's first hope was to be set free from this oppression. After showing them this incredible vision of restoration that would come by shattering the yoke of their oppressors, Isaiah continued on to show them the second way this vision would come about. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumults and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. It's kind of a weird image if you think about it. It kind of doesn't work for us very well today with the way um, we do war. Uh, but if, if you think about it, first off, what does it mean if boots used in battle and bloody garments are destined to be fuel for the fire? What about the swords and the shields, the weapons of war? Well, the fact that Isaiah only mentions the clothing of battle and not the weapons of war implies the fate of those weapons. By mentioning only the lesser, he implies the greater as well. If boots are being burned, then weapons aren't needed either. It's actually a phenomenal picture. Think about even us today, how we yearn for peace even at a time when wars have not been fought on this soil in a hundred years or more. But what if your life was as defined by war as the Middle East has been for not hundreds, but thousands of years? In that case, peace is for you a momentary and fleeting thing but never permanent. You hear the breath of relief coming from those in Lebanon and Israel as a ceasefire is trying to be worked out. The hope that just maybe this moment will come to an end, but knowing another one lurks right around the corner. You never disarm. You never let your guard down. This image that Isaiah is casting here is an impossible dream, but it is a worthwhile hope. Their second hope was for peace, for international peace. 
Verse 6 then opens the same way as verse 4. The means of the incredible vision will be brought about by release from oppression and the establishment of peace by way of a child being born. Now, this does not imply a child king, but that a child that's going to be born is going to become king. And these things, these things are mighty and wonderful things indeed. An ever-increasing eternal reign of peace, perfect justice and righteousness. In these verses, we're told of the king's birth, the king's title, and given a brief but powerful description of his reign. The names given to this child progress from militaristic to peaceful. Wonderful counselor is the first one and refers to his knowing how to accomplish this war and kingdom building thing that is going to bring about this great vision. Mighty God could probably better be translated, God is a warrior hero. It, it was a common practice to name someone as an instrument of God's, not intending to apply any divinity to that specific person, but that that person is God's instrument, God's tool in accomplishing his ends. Everlasting Father is a title of a king whose reign is going to be permanent and eternal. And Prince of Peace means that not only has the war been won, but that peace, true peace, has been won as well. How many times in our own recent history have wars been won, but peace been absent? And finally, at the very end of our passage, what is it that will accomplish all of these things, all of that, that is talked about in this incredible vision? The zeal of the Lord Almighty the passionate and intense devotion to and love for his people will motivate God to vindicate them and fulfill his promises to David and the nation. In spite of all evidence to the contrary, the Lord has not abandoned or forgotten his people, and he will do far more than just restore them. This declaration concludes a powerful and marvelous prophecy of hope and restoration. C can you feel, can you almost taste how important this would have been to a nation that had been suffering under exile and oppression? So what happened? Wars still reign on this planet. There are no eternal and ever-expanding kingdoms on earth, and many around the world are still oppressed. Didn't Jesus come and fulfill this prophecy? Isn't that what we're told in Scripture? Isn't there something about this that just doesn't seem to make any sense? And honestly, it probably shouldn't make a whole lot of sense. You see, the truth is, that Jesus Christ has fulfilled all of the messianic prophecies and types in the Old Testament. But he hasn't done it in, in a way that anyone would have ever expected or anticipated. A warrior king, we're told. Yet, our king was born in a stable. The closest sword that Jesus ever came to holding was a carpenter's knife. As his father his earthly father, Joseph, taught him the tools of the trade. Not a single Hebrew was set free from Roman oppression for hundreds of years after Jesus passed. Quite simply, Jesus Christ defied expectation and in doing so was able to accomplish something far greater and far more significant than just mere political conquest. Israel, you see, had a far deeper problem. They had the same problem that we have as well. G Israel proved herself incapable of following God on her own. God would save her, and time and again she would turn away. Don't we find ourselves doing the same thing? Have we not been given an incredible gift, but constantly turn away to follow our own comparatively petty visions and dreams. As Paul says time and again, we are incapable of following after God 
because of our sin and brokenness. Just like with the nation of Israel, even when our errors have been pointed out to us, we're unable to do good and follow in the paths of righteousness. By defying expectation, God was able to do what only He could to free us from the oppression of our sin and grant us peace with God. And so we, too, find ourselves in a position where our hope is the same as Israel's hope. As Israel had been oppressed by the nations surrounding it, we have been oppressed by our own sinfulness. Israel yearned for a peace granted by God, a peace that can only come by having peace with God. True peace will never be had until all bend the knee to Christ the Lord. It would be easy, and many these days take this tack, to claim that we are the victims of others who oppress us, maybe a bully at school, an overbearing boss at work. But how often are we oppressed by our own failings, by our own inability to do as we know we should? The wonder worked by Christ is that not only can we be set free from sin's oppression, but in some way we don't fully understand, set free from the oppression that others attempt to inflict us upon us as well, even if our circumstances don't change. In much the same way, as Israel longed for political peace, we find ourselves longing for someone to calm the inner and outer storms of our lives. Some of these storms are of our own making. Some of the storms are from others, and we just find ourselves getting caught up in them. As Jesus was able to calm the storm on the Sea of Galilee, he can calm the storms of our lives as well. The peace that we yearn for is within our reach. Although, as with Israel, that peace may not take the form that we would expect it to, or that we might even want it to, that does not make that peace any less real, though. To say that the way Christ came into the world was a surprise would be an understatement. To say that how he fulfilled prophecy defied expectation would border on trivializing the issue. Each year we celebrate this unexpected, surprising wonder to the point that it has kind of become common and expected for us. Amidst the noise and confusion, the oppression and the chaos that is the American Christmas holiday season, what unexpected ways might the Christ be trying to bring freedom from oppression and peace into our lives and into our communities? Israel almost missed the Christ because he did not come the way that they expected. Don't miss Christ yourself this season for the same reason. May God bless each one of us this Advent season as we embrace the fullness of Israel's hope by recognizing the three ways our hope is the same as theirs. Amen. Would you please take a moment to pray with me? Lord God, every year Christmas comes around and we know what to expect. Maybe we get a little bit surprised each year by uh, just how early the stores begin to stock the Christmas decorations. I think I saw some, Lord, this year where some stores put Christmas stuff out before Halloween had even gotten here. But that really isn't much of a surprise either. And yet in the midst of it, Lord, You continue to work wonders and miracles. You continue to defy expectation so that you can do something far greater than we would have ever dreamed. This Advent season, Lord, would you defy our expectations yet again? Continue to draw us closer to you, to show us the wonder of who you truly are, of who you have come to enable us to be so that we can know you more fully and more truly. So that we can see you for the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior that you are. So that we can be freed from our oppression. 
and experience a peace for which our souls truly yearn. All of this, Lord, is made possible by your zeal, the zeal that you made manifest in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for loving us far more than we could ever dream or imagine. It is in the name of that wondrous Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.